Well, good morning, everyone. I thought we would um, we'd look at a part two of this ministry of one. And um, I don't know that I fully was able to express what I was feeling about the study when I first started to, uh, to do part one. But what I wanted to emphasize is, is the importance of one-on-one -on -one ministry. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. The, the Word of God is alive, and whatever the Lord says to, to one, He says to all. And in Jeremiah 1, 7, He says, But the Lord said unto me, Don't say that you are only a boy. You will go wherever I send you, and you will say whatever I command you to say. And what I hear the, the Spirit saying to me is, is that He'll lead me to wherever I need to be, and He'll fill my mouth with the words that need to be said. And so... Uh, this is a one-on-one -on -one ministry verse. I mean, this is, this is what we do. He brings people into our path. And, um, and uh, He gives them messages by filling our hearts what to say out of His Word. So I wanted to, to go back over a little bit. I thought about this a little bit when I was at home. Uh, last week I kind of did off the cuff. The last time I spoke I did. Uh, and so what I want to say is the Lord had every type of platform when He was here on earth. Uh, he knew what it was like to dress thousands or minister to just one person. The ideal that only mega ministries are evidence of success, that's entirely a carnal notion fueled by one's own ego, and it's not consistent with what Jesus said about the ministry he had with 5,000 or the one-on-one uh, one -on -one ministry where he expressed the most pleasure in the results. And that's what I was trying to say. I don't want to say anything disparaging about big churches, what I, wanted, what I want to emphasize is how important one-on-one -on -one ministry is and, and get a God's eye perspective on one-on-one -on -one ministry. So with these big ministries, there is often lukewarmness that is associated with these large movements. Uh, commonplace is the lack of faith, the lack of repentance, the lack of the fruit of the Spirit, and even a depth of a real understanding of the Scriptures or a real relationship with God. So when we're getting Jesus' perspective on success, what, we, what we'll see is that, uh, um, that this, uh, getting Jesus' perspective on success will show He measured success by true faith and repentance being the result of that ministry. And even the fruit, you know, even John the Baptist when he was baptized, and, and this, this word was used, this phrase was used by more than just John, but by the apostles as well. That, that they should bring forth fruit, meat for repentance. In other words, fruit that demonstrated that they had repented. So there should be, th their behavior should follow as an example of, of their repentance. And so whenever someone truly had faith in, in who Jesus was and truly repented, then that, he expressed pleasure in that in the scriptures. So one-on-one -on -one ministry more often produces the results that Jesus wanted rather than the large gatherings. And we, we started off last time I spoke with the large gathering and how he just slipped off from it and he wasn't happy with it. And when they chased him down, he had some things to say to him. And so, and those things weren't positive. So the purpose of this study is to magnify the importance of one-on-one -on -one ministry of each Christian so that the world view does not make you feel like something success, that, that, is, that is successful in God's eyes is a failure in your own eyes. And uh, I have felt that before. Uh, we have, um, we've had people come in and, and we've gone around doing some one-on-one uh, -on -one ministry and invited people to a meeting and it's like uh, only half a dozen came or something and I felt like it was a lot of work for a little nothing. That's, that's just wrong. Because it was those little ministries that were, where change actually took place that Jesus emphasized His pleasure. And so we just got something going on in our thinking that's not in sync with Jesus. And, um, and there, was a, there was another example too. I was led. I was led to a place to, to do a ministry. And, um, and the, um, the projects in New Waverly. That was something that I was shown was coming. And it came. And I went. And I was there a long time, and I baptized one woman. And I just always wondered, why was I sent there? Well, it was for that one woman. And I could not, I could not get God's perspective. And I, I feel badly about that now. And um, years passed, and that woman started coming up, 
started coming up again and I called her and all of her kids had been baptized except one and well except two and one was getting baptized that uh, that Sunday and I went and so it just there, there was some things that God was doing that he just didn't let me know he was doing and uh, he will he will do exactly like he said he would do for himself he will do with you send you away from 90 and 9 to go get one and that's a big deal to God and if there is true change in that one person, then that's, that's what gives him great pleasure, is the true change, the true repentance in that one person. So we're going to look at some examples where Jesus' ministry of one truly changed a life. The first one is the blind man at the temple. We say that he was a blind man that went to the temple to give the, to tell the Pharisees a what for. Okay, And we're going to look at this story. Because he didn't see who healed him. Jesus told him to go and wash. And then so he was like kind of left, um, you know, with uh, some unanswered questions because he started seeing after Jesus told him to go wash. And so in John 9, verse 1 through 7, it says, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. he never seen. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither has this man sinned or his parents but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. And so, you know, Jesus is doing what he always does. He's teaching things. We might assume some things are true, and they're not. And he's actually teaching them the case here. And so it says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. And so Jesus was able to go and do good to people and teach them who he was while it was day. But there was darkness was going to be given power soon. And that would be the day that he would be crucified. And of course, God would use whatever Satan was doing to save the world. And, if, and the Bible even says, in the scriptures, it says that if Satan, had, if the power of darkness had only known, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. They had no idea that what they were doing would help so many people. So Jesus gave himself. And so he was saying that it was time for him to work. It wasn't his time to be, to be nailed to a cross. So he was working while it was day. And he said the time was coming that no one would be able to do that freely. So as he says, as long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. And that's who he was. Jesus was the Savior of the world, the light of the world. He was bringing a knowledge of God and a knowledge of, of, of the righteousness of God to this land. And a way, the way to God through the Savior Jesus. He was bringing all that. He was the light of the world. And when he had thus spoken, he sped on the ground. Now listen, this guy's blind, and he's listening to what Jesus is saying to his disciples. And he's not seeing it. And so when he had thus spoken, he sped on the ground and made clay of spittle and anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. And he went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. So Jesus did all this on purpose. You know, he could have just touched him. He could have just said to see, but he didn't. He sent him to go wash, and he came seeing. So what happened was the neighbors, in verse 8, the neighbors therefore, and they which before had seen him that was blind, said, is not him, this him that sat and begged? And some said, this is him, and others said, well, it's like him. But he said, I am he. Therefore said they unto him, How were your eyes opened? And he answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and I received sight. Then said they unto him, Where is he? He said, I don't know. So this is, this is where he is. So this is what these people do. They want to check with establishment. So they brought, they brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind. And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then again, the Pharisees also asked him how he received his sight. And he said to them, He put clay on my eyes, and I wash, and I do see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. What he was not keeping was their ideal of what should happen on the Sabbath day. He wasn't keeping their man-made rules and their traditions of men. 
And it's not much different in some churches today. They want to read the Bible, interpret it for everyone, and say you got to meet their standard for keeping it or their ideal of what this means. To, in other words, you got to do the Scriptures plus what they say it means to you in order to be accepted of them. And uh, they're just a modern-day Pharisee. The Scriptures were meant to be alive inside of you and for God to reveal to you personally the parts that you were ready to receive. And you're supposed to be able to read it and understand it for yourself without someone telling you what you've got to do to obey it. And so that's the purpose for Romans 14, is how that, that uh, people can, uh, can read it, get different ideals about it, and as long as they're true to what they believe it's saying, then they can be different and they should be in fellowship with one another. But it's not the case with the Pharisee. You disagree with the Pharisee on what it, what, what the way it should be performed, and you're out. See? And so, therefore, said that some of the Pharisees, this man's not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, he can, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. And so, obviously, what Jesus wasn't doing, Jesus wasn't sinning when he was healing people on the Sabbath. A man's own common sense should tell him that. But unfortunately, doctrines of men have a tendency to blind and enslave men into ideals that are not right. And so there was a division among them. And they say unto the blind man again, What sayest thou of him? Now they're asking the guy that was healed. And he would only say of him, He's a prophet. But even that was, uh, was, uh, un was offensive to them. And so this is this just their unbelief with threats now coming out. And this is usually the way it goes. The Pharisees will threaten everyone to, uh, to line up with their ideals or be cast out. And that's not any different than what they were doing in the day of Jesus. So in uh, 18 it says, But the Jews did not believe concerning him, and that he had been blind, and they, that he had received his sight. So they wouldn't even believe that Jesus had this power, even though Jesus had been doing all these things in plain sight for a long time now. So they called his parents and asked them how he received his sight. And, and they asked them, saying, Is this your son, whom you say was born blind? How doth he now see? And his parents had answered them and said, We know this is our son, and that he was born blind. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, ask him, and he'll speak for himself. But the scriptures reveal these words spake his parents because they feared the Jews, because the Jews had agreed already that if anybody confessed that Jesus was the Christ, they were going to put him out of the church, see? Put him out of the synagogue. And so they didn't want to answer. So, in verse 23, this is the Pharisees telling people what to think, which is what they often do. You've got to think like they think. You've got to think whatever they tell you to think, or they put you out and have no fellowship with you. Therefore said his parents, he is of age, ask him. So, in verse 24, then again called they the man that was born blind, and said, said unto him, Give God the praise, we know this man is a sinner. So now they're telling him what to think. And he answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or not, I know not. One thing I know, I was blind and now I see. And so he, he's getting a little tired of, of what they're doing. He knows something's wrong here with, with their attitude and their unbelief. Then said they unto him, What did he unto thee? How opened the eyes? He answered them said, I've told you already and you didn't hear. Wherefore, would you hear it again? Will you also be his disciples? In other words, you ever going to change your mind about this man? Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we're Moses' disciple. And we know that God spake unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. But he answered again. Now he's getting bold with them. And the man answered and said unto them, Where herein is a marvelous thing that you know not where he is, from whence he is, and yet he has opened my eyes. So he knows that this power is the power of God, and it was worked through Jesus. And so he stood up to him, and, uh, and there was something wrong, wrong, and he knew something was wrong. 
And so in verse 31, he they, it says, Now we know that God heareth not sinners. And this is what he's saying, that God doesn't hear sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God, doeth his will, him he heareth. So he's saying that Jesus had to be of God to be able to open his eyes. And since the world began, it was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind. If this man was not of God, he could do nothing. So this was his answer. He had more to say to these Pharisees. And so now they're angry and they answered and said to him, Thou was altogether born in sins and now you're going to teach us? And they cast him out. So see, they, were the, they, they saw themselves as the teachers, as the ones that were the instructors. They couldn't be instructed. And Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? And so Jesus let all this happen. That's why he sent him away to wash his eyes. And so he, now he wants it. You know, this is the way it is. Many times people don't find Jesus till they get cast out of a church. And so here he is. Jesus seeks him out. He says, Do you believe on the Son of God? Now he's telling him who he is. And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Now that's coming to Jesus right there. Okay? The impotent man, a man that was sick 38 years. Healing on the Sabbath again. Well, Jesus did this a lot. Really bothered the, the Pharisees, didn't it? In verse 1 through 6 of John 5, it says, Later Jesus went to Jerusalem for a Jewish festival. Near the sheep gate in Jerusalem was a pool called Bethesda. And uh, in Hebrew, it had five porches. Under the, the, these porches, a large number of sick people. Under these porches, a large number of sick people, people who were blind, lame, paralyzed. Uh, this is where they, they lied down. And it says, One man who had been sick for 38 years was lying there. And Jesus saw the man lying there and knew that he had been sick for a long time. So Jesus asked the man, would you like to get well? And in verse 7, here he is breaking the traditions of men again, but not the laws of God. Verse 7, it says, though impotent man answered him, said, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me in the pool, but while I am coming, another step is down before me. And of course, um, in the context somewhere here, it explains that an angel troubled the water. Uh, and when the water was troubled, whoever stepped in first was healed. It was something that God was doing in this pool at that time, and they all knew it. So Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and he took up his bed and walked. On the same day was the Sabbath. And the Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. And he answered, He that made me whole said I could carry my bed. So again, this is just another one of the rules that they decided would be too much to do and be called work on the Sabbath. And so then, then they asked him, What man is he that said unto thee, Take up the bed and walk? And he that was healed wist not who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. So Jesus just kind of slipped off. After he told him to take up his bed and walk, he just was immediately healed. And he just got up, carried his bed. In verse 14, Afterward Jesus found him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. So this is important because Jesus is healing with instructions. Okay? Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon thee. And we know a lot of times that diseases are associated with behavior. Okay? And so... It says the, uh, the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. So again, this man, uh, this man was healed and he carried the information to the establishment to tell him that it was Jesus that was healing uh, by the power of God. Unbelief. In verse 17, and we're just uh, looking for the, the next verse in this story. But Jesus answered, in the, uh, uh, answered them, My father worketh here too, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he had only, 
because he had not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. And so these things that Jesus was saying was true. He was the Son of God. They didn't believe. And, um, and so they wanted to kill him. It just wasn't time yet. And so he was doing the work, healing the people, showing that he was the very Christ. And they were threatening that if any man says he's the Christ, they would put him out of the synagogue. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that he himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. And of course they were going to witness him raise Lazarus from the dead soon. And he even talks about the power to raise the dead here. For as the Father raises up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. And so he continued to work the power of God even in the raising of Lazarus. For the Father judgeth no man, but committeth all judgment to the Son. So he, again, he was healing with instruction. He was healing with teaching them who he was. And uh, there, there was all this unbelief. The woman caught in the very act of adultery. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> the first thing I'd like to say about this is they brought this woman and set her before Jesus and shamed her, but there was, they didn't bring the man. You know, there was, there was nothing real in all of this. It was just to find something to accuse Jesus of. And um, so they were bringing this case before Jesus, and Jesus went to the, he went to the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning came, came again to the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. So he was teaching them the words of God, and the scribes of the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law, and the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what do you say? This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down, and with his finger he wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. And when they continued asking him, he lifted himself up and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him cast a first let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. So again, this is another case of forgiveness with instruction to this woman. Okay? And they which heard it began to be convicted by their own conscience and went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even to the last, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto the woman, Where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. So she got forgiveness with instruction. Stop doing what you're doing. And then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. So Jesus began to speak again, even, even to this woman. I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of light. So go and sin no more. Jesus is the light of the world. And, it's, and we need to follow him and not walk in this darkness, not do these things, but have the light of the world. So it's always healing or forgiveness with instruction. It's what Jesus was doing. Now the last one I want to talk about is the leper, the one that returned. There was ten that were healed. And um, th I think probably the, one of the best stories that we, that we can do on one-on-one -on -one ministry would have been Mary Magdalene. There's a lot in the New Testament, in the Gospels about her. And um, I, I think there's some misconceptions about her too. I don't think people have been fair with Mary. And, um, but, and I, I, did, I did gather some stuff on her, but it was too much to do with the four that, that I had already. So let's just look at the leper. Uh, the one that turned back. In Luke 17, verse 11, it says, And it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And he entered into a certain village, and there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, 
have mercy on us. So they knew who he was, and they knew that he had the power to do this. And when he, when he saw them, he said to them, Go show yourself unto the priest. And it came to pass, as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. And fell down, at his, fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, where are, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? There are, not found, there are not found that return to give glory to God save this stranger. And he's calling him a stranger because he was Samaritan. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith have made thee whole. And so again, his, the Samaritan's faith in Jesus and who he was made him whole. So again, it's like <clears throat> Jesus healing with instruction, healing with teaching. <clears throat> These are all the examples that I chose today uh, to talk about the ministry of one. And I just wanted to just, just show how many times there was one person that was really affected by the ministry of Jesus why it seemed the crowds were not getting it or were in opposition to what he was teaching and what he was showing. And so um, I, I did all this because uh, when, when this was presented, to some, someone just had posted some, some material on this on Facebook, and I so happened to follow this person, I was reading it. And it, it really convicted me because of the stories I told you all about in the beginning. It's like some of the work we did, it felt like there wasn't many results. But these are, the, these are the instances where Jesus really expressed um, his satisfaction in the results of one person because there was true faith or true repentance. And um, we just need God's perspective and the work that we're doing. We need to know that when he brings us to people and fills our mouth with words, that that's important to him. And we're doing what we're supposed to do and not feel like at the end of the day we'll only, you know, talk to a few people and you didn't you may or may not have saw the results of what you what you shared with them. You may or may not ever see the results of what you share with them. Um, but there may be some results you don't know about. You know? So anyway, that's all I'm gonna share with you. I turn it back over to the brother in charge.